So just a couple of announcements before we start. Uh, please, let me just confirm with Paul. So please save your questions for the Q&A after his presentation. He's going to present about 45 minutes and then leave another 45 minutes for Q&A. So there's extensive amount of time to ask questions. Uh, we will have a short three to five minute break after his presentation and between the Q&A so you can get up and get some coffee and snacks and what have you. And last thing, please turn your cell phones off. <laughs> or on lecture mode as I have here. <laughs> All right. Believe it or not, Paul was initially terrified by storms, but fear transitioned to fascination as he began reading about weather and then made a decision to be a weatherman at the tender age of seven. <laughs> what took you so long, Paul? <laughs> Paul studied meteorology at U of M, and in 1987, he became one of the youngest meteorologists ever selected to serve on the Board of Broadcast Meteorology in the American Meteorological Society. He was later named chairman in 1990. By the way, can everybody hear me in the back? Good? All right. Paul has researched, written, and produced many documentaries, including Forecast Overlord, the story about the weather, weather's impact on D-Day in World War II, which was added to the D-Day archives at the Dwight D. Eisenhower Presidential Library. <coughs> His 2014 live climate change webcast earned him a first place award from Michigan Association of Broadcasters. Paul is only one of four meteorologist in the world ever to be named an AMS Fellow, Certified Broadcast Meteorologist, and Certified Consulting Meteorologist. The Gross Weather Bill, a Michigan bill bearing his name, required tornado safety drills to be conducted in the Michigan public schools. Paul and his wife Nancy have two adult sons, and he enjoys collecting maps as well as stamps and coins. And so, with apologies to Al Roker, I give you the best weatherman, Paul Gross. Well, thanks very much, Curtis. And, and I want to start, by the way, with an apology. I have a bit of an allergy-type thing I'm fighting this morning, so I'll be coughing a little bit, and I apologize for that, but it's just, you know, these things happen to people. But uh, I am really happy to be here. I love teaching about this subject, and I want to make it very, very clear that this is a science discussion. I'm not getting into the politics. Uh, during the Q&A later, maybe some of you have questions about that, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the science. And you're not gonna get uh, slides of starving polar bears and things. I'm not gonna apply in your emotions or anything like that. You're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna get some science here. I'll make it interesting, but you're gonna get some science here. You're not gonna remember everything I'm gonna tell you, but you're gonna walk out of here with certain concepts that you will remember, and those will be talking points. So people ask me all the time, well, what do you believe in? You believe in global warming. You believe in climate change. And, I, and my answer is the same to everybody. I don't believe in anything. All I do is follow the science. So before I get started with this, um, just wanna take care of a little bit of business. Uh, first of all, I use the terms global warming and climate change interchangeably. I personally like the term global warming better because it is a warming of the globe, uh, whereas climate has always changed, but this is a particular warming that we're talking about. It doesn't really matter. Global warming, climate change, some people like to say there's a political inference to using one over the other. No, uh, I, I use them interchangeably with no uh, intention uh, in any way whatsoever. I just use them uh, interchangeably. Uh, the other thing, uh, people, you know, what qualifies me to talk about the subject? I mean, obviously I'm a meteorologist, but I have been following this subject very carefully for a lot of years. In fact, long before this was on the radar of most TV meteorologists, I interviewed my first climate scientist in the early 1990s. So I have been following this issue for a very, very long time. I have traveled the world to interview some of the most eminent climate scientists on this planet. And I can attest to their, to their intentions, their work, and their work ethic. And I, I don't just go and just attend meetings and listen to these people. I go and I talk to them, and I get contact information for these people. 
So when I have a question myself, or somebody asks me a question and I don't know the answer, I have, I have resources to ask. And so I'm, I'm emailing climate scientists all the time with questions and things, just things that I haven't encountered before that I you know, need to know an answer to, things like that. So, uh, so that's what qualifies me. And, and again, this is not a political discussion. Okay, I'm just gonna get to you with the science, but um, what I'm, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, Curtis and I were talking about the, uh, the seven principles, and I think climate change very directly has a symbiosis with the seven principles. The first principle uh, is, is the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and I would argue that there is worth and dignity to every person on this planet. The, and I've said this for many years, the value of a life here in Oakland County, Michigan is no less important than the value of a life or no less important than a life on a Pacific Island nation. We are all human beings that live on this planet. And so I think, I think that first principle is self-explanatory. And then the sixth principle, which is the goal of um, world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. The key word there is justice because there's something called environmental justice. And environmental justice, listen, to live on this planet, we have to have a certain environment that supports life. And so we all deserve the justice of an environment that allows us to live. So I think this fits in very nicely with the, with the seven principles. So uh, with that, I want to get started. So I guess, Curtis, you'll start uh, uh, hit the slides for me. Uh, I'm going to see. I, I have, you know, Curtis provided me with a laser pointer. I got that. And then this, by the way, this is Brandon Rue's former golf club. Uh, sorry, I've got somebody in the back here. This is Brandon Rue's former golf club. He's a very close friend of mine. Uh, he he took a swing. The club head flew off. And I said, I want that shaft. That, that, that makes a nice pointer. That makes a nice little saber too. But uh, but anyhow, so uh, all right. So uh, in terms of climate change, it's happening now. Uh, it's human caused, as you will see. Uh, some impacts are irreversible for at least a thousand years, and actions today can limit warming. <coughs> and we'll go back one second. Curtis. <coughs> the key word is limit, because if somebody says we have to stop global warming, stopping global warming, that is an extremist view, because at the, we're actually past the point of stopping the warming for many decades. We're kind of locked into some warming no matter what we do right now. What we need to do is we need to slow the warming. By slowing the warming, what you do then is you give different animal species and plant species time to adapt or to migrate. You give humans the ability and the time to mitigate. Okay? So that key word is limit because we're warming and we can't stop that right now, but we can at least slow it down. Now you can go to the next slide. All right, so what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the science, indicators, impacts of the warming, uh, some local impacts, and then a uh, very short uh, section called the future. So go on to the next one. All right, this is a very basic um, uh, little schematic here. There's something called the greenhouse effect. Now, you've heard of greenhouse gases. Those are the heat-trapping gases of the atmosphere. Those take on a very negative connotation. Okay, and that's because of all the you know all the arguments that go on about this subject. But without the greenhouse effect, life as we know it on this planet would not survive. In fact, without that greenhouse effect, I know you guys in the back can't read this, but without without those greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, our planet's average temperature would be zero degrees Fahrenheit. So we need these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Okay, and so what happens is sun's radiation comes in. Some of it escapes back to, back to space, and some of it is held in by those gases. A very simple concept, okay? All right, next slide. <coughs> All right, our atmosphere, these greenhouse gases that I just mentioned, they're actually a very, very small amount of our atmosphere. 99% of our atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen, and then those greenhouse gases are just a trace, okay? So water vapor, Carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are the four most important greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, you all know about water vapor, you know what that is, and then the others, 
are gases, you know, carbon dioxide, well, water vapor is technically a gas as well, but I'm talking about uh, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide are human produced gases. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. This is not new science. Okay, back in 1863, 1863, John Tyndall, he actually predicted that doubling carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would warm the Earth's surface. 1863, okay? And then it got more specific. In 1895, Svantorinius, he actually had, a, he did some calculations and came up with a prediction of his own. He said that the Arctic would warm 15 degrees Fahrenheit if carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increased by two to three times what the level was at that time. At that time, carbon dioxide was at a level of 295 parts per million. Right now, we're well over 400, okay? And so, guess what? 1895, and he was right. And actually, some of the earliest climate model uh, and climate science predictions about the warming, some of the earliest predictions actually said that the poles, the Arctic, would warm faster than the middle latitudes, and that is also uh, coming true. All right, next slide. All right, so people say all the time, Hasn't our climate changed before? Haven't we warmed up before? The answer is absolutely 100% yes. But all of those previous warmings over the past millions of years, all of them were caused by astronomical changes. Any of these things, the eccentricity of our axis, you know, the Earth's axis around the sun is not a perfect circle, okay? So changes in the, the orbit around the sun, changes in our, in our tilt, the precession of our axis, the axis shifts every uh, 10,000 years, or uh, 23,000 years, sorry about that. So all of the previous warmings that our planet has experienced are because of things like this. None of that stuff has happened today. None of that stuff is happening right now. Something other than this is what's causing our current warming, okay? All right, next slide. <clears throat> now before going further, we need to talk about how do we know what the composition of our atmosphere was in the past? How do we know what global temperatures were in the past? Well, the most important one is this one up here. Those are ice cores. So let's explain this. Up at the poles, or down at the poles, depending upon which pole and where you are, one's up, one's down. Um, at the poles, obviously it snows every year, and then the next year it snows on top of that year's snow and then the next year snows on top of that year's snow, and that goes on for hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Well, over time, that snow, that snowpack builds up, and the snow gets crushed, and it turns into ice, because just that snow is, well, what is snow? Snow is, is an ice crystal. So you crush, the weight of that snowpack crushes the snow and turns it into ice. Well, what happens is air bubbles, air bubbles pop into, I pop into, air bubbles form in that ice, okay? And what that air bubble is, is that the air that this planet had that many years ago. So they've been drilling down, and they're now down, I think they're now to two to three million years into the past, okay? And so you can see here, this is, a, and I, this is one of the ice cores right here. They bring those things up and they, they tag them, they put them in freezers, and they store them, and then they insert needles, and they extract air from those trapped air bubbles, okay? So now, scientists know what the composition of our atmosphere was going back hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. And in addition to the composition of our atmosphere, there's an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, okay? Deuterium fluctuates, the level of deuterium in our atmosphere fluctuates based on the planet's average temperature. So, by tracking the levels of deuterium, they can also track, uh, track the relative temperature of our planet. So not only can they track all those atmospheric gases, but they can also track, corresponding to those changes in those gases, they can track the temperature of our planet just from extracting air from those bubbles in that polar ice. So that's how we know, that's how we know how the atmosphere, the composition of our atmosphere has changed over millions of years. That's how we know how much the temperature has changed. So let's go to the next graph, and this is gonna show you 
carbon dioxide, okay, from, and this, this graph goes back 800,000 years, okay, but they now have, they, uh, I haven't seen a graph of it yet, but they have data now going back, I think, uh, two to three million years. But if you look, <coughs> you see all sorts of ups and downs here, which is perfectly normal, okay? All sorts of ups and downs. And then you look at the current time and look at what's happened. That's why I like this pointer. <laughs> so, before, okay, if you go back just 800,000 years, okay, before the present time, the previous highest amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere was 300,000 parts, uh, sorry, 300 parts per million, okay? We're now over 400. We're at like 410, 408, 410, okay? So, the Industrial Revolution started here, and that's where we put it, started putting uh, enormous amounts of greenhouse gases into our atmosphere, okay? And you can see very clearly, I mean, you could argue, hey, yeah, we're at a point here where it should start going up. Well, the Industrial Revolution started here, and it didn't just go up, I mean, it, it, I mean, it did this, okay? So, let's go to the next graph. <coughs> this is now a little more detailed, goes back a thousand years, and this has all three of those other greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. Industrial revolution started here. And you notice, going back a thousand years, look how stable those gases were. For a thousand years, those gases were stable. Then all of a sudden, you start you know, industry and, and putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and you just see the levels correspondingly rise. It's, it's exponential. So you can see the impact that humans have had, and, and it is an accurate, a 100% correct statement for me to tell you that humans have changed the composition of our planet's atmosphere. We have changed the composition of our planet's atmosphere, and that's important because there are only three things, well, really three main things that determine the temperature that a planet has. One is the distance from its star, Okay, that makes sense. The further you are, the closer you are, that's going to impact how hot or cold you are. The other one is your surface albedo. In other words, the color of the planet. Dark colors absorb more solar radiation than light colors. So just like in the summer, we tell you to wear light colored clothing. Okay, that keeps you a little bit cooler than if you wore a dark colored clothing. So the other thing is the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Well, the, the, the color of our planet and the distance from the sun has not changed in, in a long time here. And so that leaves only one thing, and that leaves the composition of our atmosphere. And you can see there, you can just see the, uh, the very rapid increase at the start of the Industrial Revolution. All right, next, next slide. All right, uh, this is a very important slide. I call it the smoking gun slide. Um, I debated uh, about putting it later in the presentation, but I put it up here now because one of the most common questions I get from people is, but how do we know it's the human impact that's causing the warming. How do we know that that's the cause? Humans are the cause. Now, I've got to explain this a bit. When climate scientists, before I actually talk about this, I've got to explain first. When climate scientists develop those climate models that project climate in the future, you have to have a way to assess, well, how, you know, how much uh, value does this model have? How, how good is it? So what they do is they take past data, say from, 1900 to 1950 or something, and they will put that into the model and see if the model can predict what happened after 1950 or 1960, okay? And so if the model can pretty accurately predict what, what's happened over, over, say, the past 50 years, then maybe it has some value, okay? And if the model doesn't accurately show what we already know has happened, well, then you gotta go back to the drawing board, okay? So what they did, okay, this uh, climate scientist, I got this from a climate scientist in Germany, and what he did is he took a, a bunch of climate models that were deemed reliable climate models, kind of averaged them all together, okay, and, and he plotted what those models would have predicted, okay, just kind of, it's an average of climate models, okay, that's the green line here. So if you look at the green line, and you go to 1960, well, you, you have some warming here from 1890, to 1960, there's some warming, and notice, it's not a straight line. Think of temperatures as the stock market. You ever see the stock market just go like this over the course of a year, or this? 
No, it goes like this. Well, that's the same thing with temperatures, okay? So the green line are those climate models, okay? The orange line is observations. In other words, what has actually happened. So of course, you find some differences, like there were some differences here between the green and the orange line. But if you look at the overall trend, there was gradual warming to 1960, and then both the, 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 the green line, which is what the climate models projected, and what's actually happened have both sharply risen upward in the past 50 years, okay? Now, what's important to note is that those climate models, the green line, that includes anything that could possibly force a change in our climate. Um, solar activity and, and, and volcanoes and, and, and just anything that they could possibly think of, okay? So then what the scientists did, they took that same set of climate models and they ran them again with one exception. They took out the human-caused increase in those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They took that out, and so they ran the models without the human impact. And that's what the blue line is. And so if you look here, since 1960, without the human impact, the climate models actually projected that we should have actually cooled slightly. But we know that that's not what happened. We've been skyrocketing since 1960. So that's how we know that the human footprint is there. Okay. Plus, the type of carbon dioxide that's produced by our industry is a different type of carbon dioxide than what naturally occurs. So that's another thing. They can actually type the, uh, the, uh, the particular actual molecule of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that's why I call this a smoking gun uh, slide because it actually shows it actually shows the human footprint that's causing the increase in those greenhouse gases which has then caused the change in our climate. All right, now I'm going to go a little quicker through some slides. If you're wondering where these emissions come from, and carbon dioxide is about 82% of them, and I'll get I'll get into the sector that causes them in a second. 82% is carbon dioxide, 10% methane, 5% nitrous oxide, and by the way, 3% is uh, fluorinated gas. Okay, so now we'll go to the next one. <coughs> and by the way, methane is important because even though carbon dioxide stays up there much, much longer than methane, methane has a quicker lifespan, it's important to remember methane is a significantly more potent heat-trapping gas than carbon dioxide. So methane is something in particular we've got to keep an eye on. So all right, here's where all that stuff comes from. 28% comes from transportation and electricity, 22% comes from industry, 11% is commercial, residential, 9% is agriculture. And yes, agriculture is a part of the, the, the problem, okay? So that's kind of, if you, if you really look at this, you could say, well, looks like about 80% uh, or so comes from transportation, electricity generation, and industry. Okay, that's where about 80% of that comes. All right. The, uh, oh no, go forward, sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Excellent. Yeah. All right. People ask, so is there really a disagreement about what's happening with the planet's climate? Okay. Among politicians, there is. Okay. But I'm a scientist, and I'm only talking about the scientists. The scientific community is almost in unanimous agreement on this. 97% of actively publishing climate scientists that have published papers in, in the scientific journals agree that human-caused climate change is happening. And a similar number of these researchers have pub published papers in the scientific journals in which the paper's conclusion supports the concept of human-caused climate change. In fact, in uh, I forget which, which one of these journal articles I read, I think it was the second one, they said that the number of papers that the number of scientific papers that are coming in that have a conclusion contrary to what the majority of climate scientists around the world uh, uh, feel, uh, the quote, I mean, I'm gonna quote it. They said the number of those papers is quote unquote, vanishingly small. So the scientific research community, okay, is in large step, lockstep agreement on this stuff. Yes, you're always gonna find some scientists that have something they disagree with, and, um, but the way I, the analogy I like to use is, and some of us in this room are actually uh, old enough to remember this, but when the first medical studies 
started coming out that said that smoking predisposed us to certain illnesses like cancer and, and emphysema and things like that. Okay, When those first studies started coming out, there were doctors that, that were very much skeptical about that. And, and over a period of time, more and more research came out. And after a period of time, there was an overwhelming balance of medical research that showed that smoking predisposes us to certain medical ailments. Okay, And so it, it, it became settled science. And that's kind of where we're getting with climate change among the scientific community. Okay, among the scientific community. Okay, there is just an overwhelming balance of climate research that is showing everything that I'm, that I'm telling you. So, all right, let's go to the next one. All right, so we're going to now move to uh, indicators. And so this is, in other words, so what are, what are some of the things that this warming is causing? Well, go to the next one. So uh, the last five years on record globally, we're talking about the whole planet, the last five have been the hottest five uh, in recorded history. And that, when we say recorded history, we're talking about going back to like 1870, 1880, okay? And so uh, that's where we have what we call is the reliable instrument record, okay? So last year was the 42nd consecutive year, 42nd consecutive year in which the planet's average temperature was above average. And if you want to find a year uh, that the Earth had a record cold year as a planet, you have to go back over 100 years to find the last time we had a record cold year for the planet. And remember, that's why, again, this is why I like the term global warming. Just because we could be having an Arctic blast here doesn't mean that the rest of the world is having an Arctic blast. And that's just, I mean, if you all remember the polar vortex winter, 2013, 2014? Okay. I showed a map at that time. I remember, I don't, uh, one of the newscasts. And it's like there was this, the whole world was like pink and red. It was a, a map of above or below average temperatures. The whole world for that year was, was like pink and red. And there was this one dark blue spot over eastern North America. So, you know, what's happening in your backyard is not necessarily what's happening to the rest of the world. Okay? And that's, that's probably the biggest problem with Americans is that they don't think globally. We tend to just think about our own community. Okay? All right. Next one, Curtis. All right. Um, El Nino, La Nina. Next to the tilt of the Earth, El Nino and La Nina probably have the biggest impact on changing our uh, wintertime climate, for example. And so uh, I'm not going to take the time because I, I want to keep this moving, but El Nino years, it's an ocean circulation pattern. Basically, the warm waters uh, on the surface of the Pacific Ocean, when they shift eastward, it's an El Nino. When those warm waters shift westward, then it's called a La Nina. El Nino years are warm years for the planet. La Nina years are cooler years for the planet. So what this chart shows you, okay, it shows you, now the bar, above or below, the bar is showing you the, the planet's average temperature, okay? So, if it's, here's the zero line. So if it's below, that means the planet had a below average year. If it's above, that's an above average year. The orange bars are El Nino years, which are naturally warmer. The blue bars are the La Nina years, which are naturally cooler. The takeaway from this graphic is that the, the La Nina years, those cooler La Nina years, look at the recent ones. So these cooler La Nina years are now warmer than the El Nino years were in decades past. So the warming, that's, so, so people who say, well, it's warm, it's, it's El Nino or something. No, it's not. In fact, the warming is affecting the El Nino and the La Ninas. Okay? All right, next one. All right, this is, again, people ask, again, what kind of agreement is there on this stuff? What this is, is the average, uh, above or below average temperature of the planet, okay, from 1880 to 2014, done by four different very respected climate research institutes. You've got NASA, the, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. You've got the uh, UK Met Office there, the Met Office Hadley Center in uh, England. You've got the NOAA National Climatic Data Center and the Japanese Meteorological Agency. And notice, all four research, research institutions plotting here for you above or below average for the temperatures planets from 1880. And look what you the takeaways. Look at the agreement of those four sets of lines. 
Look at the agreement. So, I mean, I mean, again, you have four highly respected research institutions working totally independently of each other, coming up with nearly identical conclusions in terms of what is happening with our planet's temperatures. All right, next one, Curtis. Now, this is actually a real interesting one. Oceans. We all tend to think about the warming in terms of where we're living. Well, the oceans are heating up too. And in fact, the oceans are actually absorbing more than two thirds of the planet's extra warming right now. If we, you know, right now our planet is what, 75% ocean and, uh, and, and like a quarter, 25% land. Let's say it was 50 50. That would be less ocean absorbing, soaking in that heat. And land, we'd be warming up much, much faster on land. So we're lucky we have all of this ocean. Okay, so you can see the oceans, since 1901, the oceans are heating up extraordinarily. But did you notice a little bowling ball right here? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Greenland? You wanted to see it. Well, that, somebody just said Greenland, yeah. It's the Greenland ice sheet. We think that that could be cooler water from the Greenland ice sheet melting. And I just got a report from NASA just this past week, and I put the article on our station's website that the Greenland ice sheet now is melting seven times faster than it was melting just 20 to 30 years ago. Okay, and that that water that's flowing into the oceans <coughs> that means that the projections for sea level rise right now we are very likely on a track to see the worst case projections for sea level rise just based on the rate of melting of the Greenland ice sheet. Now, by the way, something people don't realize: what causes rising sea levels? Well, melting ice on Greenland, that sure does it. But something, if you ever hear somebody say the melting North Pole ice is going to inundate our coasts, that's wrong. Because the ice at the pole, at North Pole, it's already in the water. So think about if, uh, think about if you had a tall glass of water with ice, about half filled with ice water, and so you have water all the way to the top of the glass with ice in there. When the ice melts, the water doesn't like overflow the glass because the ice has already taken up its volume, its space in that glass. Okay, so the Arctic ice, I'm not Arctic, the polar ice at the North Pole, that's already in the glass of water. It's already in the ocean. So when the Arctic ice melts, that doesn't affect sea level rise. But when the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctica ice sheet, when those melt, that ice is on land and is flowing into the water. Okay. And so that's what rises sea level. That's about two thirds of it. You know what one third of sea level rise is? It's caused by just the fact that the oceans are warming. That's called thermal expansion. Water has a very interesting quality. When you warm up or heat water, it expands. So just the fact that the oceans are warming is causing the sea level to rise. And there are all sorts of implications. And I'll show you another chart. Um, Right now, as a matter of fact, go to the next one, Curtis, I'll show you. Now, you can see there were all, going back to the first century, there are little oscillations in sea level. That's all great. And then you get to the 20th century and, I mean, again, you, you look at that and you say, well, well, something has to be going on. I mean, what in God's name would have created this? What, what changed to cause this from all of this? So you can see sea level rise is accelerating, and there are repercussions to that. So for example, in Miami, I have a very good friend, a TV meteorologist down there, John Morales, who he and I have had a lot of conversations about this. Yeah, you've heard of the tides, of course. You know, the moon goes around the earth and, and it causes the tides to go up and down. And when the moon, when you have a full moon or a new moon, okay, the tides are higher, okay? And those are called king tides. Well now, in the, in the past several years, in the past 10, 15 years, whatever, uh, those king tides are now just routinely flooding places. I mean, it used to be just the high, you know, you talk about the beach, you know, the tide was high, the tide came in, the tide go out. Well, now parts of Miami are actually flooding just routinely because of these king tides. That's because of the higher sea levels. And what's really bad is that, remember, ocean water is salt water. So when that water goes inland, if it's going inland to places where there are freshwater plants or crops growing, then that's really bad news for the freshwater plants and crops. It kills them. And also when you have hurricanes coming in, I mean, you've heard of storm surge, that push of water from the wind, you know, the wind around the hurricane pushing that water inland. Well, if the sea level is higher to begin with, 
that storm surge is going to push further inland. So there's a lot, there are a lot of repercussions to sea level rise. And by the way, sea level rise does not affect the Great Lakes. That's an ocean thing. It's not a Great Lakes thing. All right, next one, Chris. I don't know if this will play or not. Oh, good. This is Arctic sea ice, okay, from, I think, I think that started around 2000. This is from satellites. So you can see what's happening to the Arctic ice. I'll just let you watch there. So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if you go, actually, go back and uh, go back one, Curtis, go back one. I'm going to play this again. Okay, so now I'll go forward again. All right, notice all the white, the bright white. The bright white is older ice, and that older ice takes longer to melt. Okay, it's being replaced by newer ice. And actually, we've actually had a couple of summers now where the entire Northwest Passage here was ice free. And, and, and believe me, there, there are all sorts of geopolitical uh, ramifications there. I mean, uh, the Russians and others are, are trying to stake claims to areas there to go drilling for oil and things like that. So, uh, so anyhow, so that, that shows you from satellite data what's been happening with the. Uh, there, guys, I mean, look at this right here. I mean, this is. That's something. All right, next one, Curtis. All right. Uh, Great Lakes. Okay, again, sea level rise doesn't affect the Great Lakes, but the warming of the climate does affect our ice cover. And you can see the trend since 1973. Now, again, you'll notice big ups and downs. So, yes, there's lots of fluctuation, but the trend is downward for uh, Great Lakes ice, ice cover in the winter. All right, next one. All right, when well, you have more open water in the Great Lakes, and you have less ice covering the Great Lakes, that means you have more lake effect snow. So again, since 1930 here, lots of ups and downs in terms of lake effect snow, but the trend is upward. Isn't that interesting? In a warmer climate, we can see more snow in certain areas. And actually, when you see me get to the Detroit statistics, I have a stat that's gonna really blow you away. But uh, all right, another thing that we look at are the glaciers, and here is, this is Muir Glacier in Alaska, and you can see a picture from identical vantage points, the same exact vantage point, 1941 and 2004. So here you have this extraordinary ice sheet here, and here you have a lake. And there your ice has already retreated back to here. Now, I've been to Alaska, and I talked to some of the people up there, and they said, oh yeah, we, we know it. I mean, I, we hear the stories from our parents. I mean, the ice, you know, it used to be here. It's now all the way over there. It, it's all over. And, and what people here, again, Alaska seems so far away and so remote, but there's something called permafrost, which is permanently frozen ground, okay? And so that means it was ground that never, ever thawed. Never before, ever thawed. And so, you know, you have roads and houses and buildings and things built on that land. Well, now some of that permafrost is thawing. And let me tell you, I mean, you're, you're seeing roads that are breaking up. You're seeing buildings that are shifting and stuff. I mean, again, these are the inhabitants of Alaska. And I, I would argue, as I said at the beginning, you know, the importance of a life in Alaska is just as important as the, you know, as a life here in Oakland County. And so, uh, so yeah, so these glaciers are, are melting. And oh, notice also, uh, the stats are here. The glacier has retreated seven miles, and the thickness of the, of the glacier has decreased by a half a mile. Think about that. Half a mile is how the thickness of the glacier is thinner now. Okay, next one. Let's see if this plays. Oh, great. All right, so if you have if you have a climate that's not changing, okay, I'm gonna have to explain this again, but uh, I'll, I'll play it again when it's done. But when you have a climate that's not changing, okay, we have climate records that go back to the 1870s, 1880s, okay, <coughs> excuse me, you would have roughly, and I'm, I'm not saying exactly, but you'd have roughly a one-to-one -one ratio of record highs to record lows, okay? I mean, you would just a natural thing to think. It'd be you'd have like equal chances, okay? So go back and then forward again, Curtis. And then, uh, it's on a, no, yeah, then now, right. Now, if, if, if it was a one to one ratio, this is what the distribution of record highs and lows would look like. But now, here we're cycling through the years here, okay? And look at what's happening to the records. The orange or the reddish color is record heat, and the blues are record cold. So, what we are doing is we're skewing the records. So, again, this curve right here, this would be an equal amount of record highs to record lows, and now, you can see that with the warming, what's happening is we're seeing an increase in heat extremes and a decrease in cold extremes. However, there are still some cold extremes. This does not mean you don't get record cold. And in fact, there's new research, a newer, last few years, from Dr. Jennifer Francis at Rutgers University 
that the warming of the climate is weakening the jet stream. And when you weaken the jet stream, that sometimes allows it to buckle up and down more sharply, and those buckles downward bring in Arctic blasts. So even though they're becoming less frequent, it's still possible to get these Arctic blasts. Okay? All right, next one. All right, we're gonna get in. this is going to go much quicker now. Impacts. And if you're worried about the downpours, like the, uh, Chuck Yeager always called it the extreme extremes. So in other words, the most extreme of the extreme weather. Well, the heaviest precipitation events here in the Great Lakes have uh, increased 42%, okay? 55% New England. But notice, even the whole country, the whole country is seeing uh, a net increase in the most intense rain events. And it's really logical why. When you evaporate water into the atmosphere, okay, that's the moisture that's available for storms to turn into precipitation. Well, if the planet's warming, you're evaporating more ocean water in the atmosphere. We are increasing the planet's atmospheric humidity. And so that is causing those high-end storm systems to have more rain or snow. Okay, And you can see that the whole country is seeing some increase, but the biggest increase is here in the Northeast. All right, next one, Chris. Oh, who has allergies here? <laughs> who knows somebody with allergies? <laughs> Who wants good news about allergies? Yeah. Well, guess what? You're not getting any. <laughs> All right. In the, in the warming of the, of the planet and with more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, okay, I mean, that's kind of good for plants if you're a plant. And so if you're a plant that produces pollen, you're going to produce more pollen. And so right now, the average, um, the average, okay, right now, again, carbon dioxide is a little above 400 parts per million. Okay, so the average plant, okay, produces eh, about seven and a half uh, million grains of pollen per plant. Okay, by 2060, we're going to more than double that, or we're, we're actually going to exactly double that. And then this is if everything's left unchanged, if the emissions are left unchecked. And by 2085, we're going to be up to all the way up to here. Okay, so if you have allergies, the future is not good. And that's a physical impact. I always like to show this because that's an actual physical impact you can directly relate to. All right, next one. All right, now let's get into some local stuff, including some local research that I did. Okay, first of all, uh, let's talk about uh, our average temperature here in the Detroit area. Okay, now you have three lines here. Okay, this white line here is the current average temperature. Okay, the um, yellow line here, the, the yellow one here, is if the, the projection for average temperature if we make significant cuts in emissions. And then if things are just left as they are now unchecked, that's this orange line. So uh, if, things, if things are left unchecked, which is the way kind of we're going right now, I mean, thus far we're not seeing a decrease in the emissions, okay? We uh, have an average summer temperature at the peak of summer here, about 84 degrees, okay? We're going to be uh, over 90 degrees for an average summer high uh, by the year uh, uh, 2100. In fact, I interviewed a climate scientist, Dr. Don Wubbles, uh, once, who specializes in regional climate change. And Dr. Wubbles said that by the year 2100, no, I think he said in 75 years. So actually, I think when I interviewed him, that'd be about, uh, said about 20, by the year 2085. But he, what he said was in 75 years, he said a southeast Michigan summer if everything's left unchecked, it's going to feel like a southwest Missouri summer does today. Right. <clears throat> it's just, that's, that could be our future. All right, now let's get into some local research that I did. Uh, I went and I counted. Okay, now first of all, I have to explain something. In any given day, you can set three different warm or cold temperature records. So let's talk about warm. You can set a record high for the day. That's the one you're most familiar with. You can set a record for the warmest low temperature for the day. And then when you take the high and the low, you add, you add them together and divide by two. That's called the average temperature for the day. You can set a record for the highest average temperature for the day. So in one day, you can actually set three different warm records or three different cold records. Okay, so you can set a record low, the, you know, you can have the coldest high temperature and then the coldest average temperature for the day. So um, I counted all of those records over the past uh, three decades. And so in the decade of 1990s, we had a three to one ratio of warm records to cold records. Now, as I showed you with that, that bar graph thing where you saw how the hot records are increasing, okay? If you saw that, you saw that, that, that 
that is skewing the type of temperature record that we get. And, and so three to one is, is unusual. If there was no warm impact on our climate, if we weren't forcing our climate into a warmer state, that wouldn't be three to one. And by the way, I did this for decades because when you do it for a decade, you kind of smooth out like maybe an unusually hot year from an unusually strong El Nino or something like that. So a decade kind of averages that stuff out and gives you a, a more realistic look. So that's the decade of the 1990s. Now let's go to the next decade, decade of the 2000s. That number jumped to six to one, a six to one ratio of record heat to record cold. Okay? So now let's go to the next one, the current decade, which we are, we only have one more year left. So I counted, and we have so far this decade, 130 warm records, 38 cold records. And by the way, and I know I have it written here as a, as a note, um, let's see, how many was it? Uh, 22, 22 of these 38 cold records occurred in those back-to-back -back cold winters, uh, 2013, 14, 2014, 2015. So that, those were two very unusual cold winters. So if you take out those two winners, I'm not taking them out because I mean, you know, they're part of the, the actual stats here, but that shows you what the ratio was for the other eight years. Okay, so so we are still we still have quite a significant ratio uh, skewed much higher toward heat records than cold records. Okay, all right, next one. And now here's the surprising one: six of our top 15 all-time snowiest winters have occurred since 2002 because we're evaporating more of that ocean water in the atmosphere. And if we get into a, um, get into a, a winter where we're in the storm track more frequently, we get more of those storms coming through, those storms have more snow. So listen, 2015, we had one of our top biggest, heaviest snowfalls in Detroit history. Remember the Super Bowl Sunday snowstorm? Okay, I mean, we had, uh, what, 14 inches or 15 inches of snow that day. So, all right, next one, Chris. Um, we, we talked about the allergy season in terms of the pollen grains. Now here's another impact, and this is specifically for Detroit, okay? We are having a longer growing season. So in other words, your last frost is coming earlier in the spring, and your first frost in the fall is coming later. So what that means is that, again, if you have allergies, you now not only are going to have an increasingly severe allergy season, but it's going to last longer, too. And these stats again are for Detroit. And just since 1970, our average growing season is 27 days longer. And by the way, some people could portray that as good news. Hey, that's a longer season of crops for our farmers and stuff. Well, here's something to think about. Let's say you get one of like uh, I don't know if you remember 2012, where we had those we had nine straight days in 70s and 80s in March. You remember that? Anybody remember that? Oh, that was incredible. I mean, we were, we were all giddy about it. We were like, my God, it's March. It's 70s, it's 80s. I mean, we had, by the last day of that heat wave, we were, I think, only three degrees short of our warmest temperature ever for the entire month of April. And that was March, okay? But what started happening was buds, you know, fruit, uh, uh, buds on fruit trees were coming out. And then, of course, you know what was gonna happen. A month or six weeks, five weeks later, we had a killing frost, and the state lost 90% uh, of its tart cherry crop, and, and others as well. So the longer growing season sounds good, but if you're now budding things earlier in the spring, you are now also putting them at risk for killing frosts. So that's not always good. All right, next one. I'm just about to wrap this up. Just in terms of uh, hot days uh, in the summer. So in other words, any day in the summer that is above average or above normal for temperatures, we have almost 18 more days that are above average for highs uh, in the summer than we had back in 1970. Okay, so so yes, it's getting hotter. Next one. Oh, people ask me, uh, what season is warming the most? Believe it or not, it's winter, followed by fall, and then you have spring and summer. Uh, now they're all warming, but the the most warming season, the, the most radical warming we're seeing, believe it or not, is winter. And by the way, when we talk about warming, everybody focuses on the high temperature. The low temperature is important too, because let's say you have a heat wave. Okay, cooler temperatures at night are what allow you a chance to recover, okay? And other and animals and things too. And so overnight lows are warming as well. And, and in fact, in, in many areas, the overnight lows are warming faster than the daytime highs are. So that's part of the, uh, part of the equation. All right, next one. Okay, uh, this is about it. We'll just, uh, um, what this shows is 
projections, temperature projections, okay, based upon extreme emission cuts and then our current path. Now extreme, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make something real clear. We are a carbon-based society. I mean, you don't even think twice when you go put gas in your car, okay? And just things like that. You don't even think twice the electricity that we use coming from the, uh, the power plant. You don't think twice about the coal burning power plants and things like that. We are a carbon-based society. We do not have the ability to just go cold turkey and just stop on a dime right now. But we need to develop those technologies that allow us to phase that stuff out, okay? And so if there were extreme emissions cuts, notice that we would still warm through, I would say through about the 2030s or 2040s, you'd still see some warming, then it would level off, and maybe you would finally start to see a little, start to see a little bit of drop off toward uh, the end of the century. But on the current path, on the current path, well, you can just see what's, what's gonna happen. And a lot, a lot of scientists put the number either at one and a half degrees or two degrees Celsius um, as kind of the, the, uh, the tipping point where you start getting a lot more, uh, a lot more bad things happening. Now, uh, there is still some debate as to what that tipping point is or should be, but that just kind of shows you the path that we're on if we do nothing versus the path that uh, that would be uh, if we had extreme cuts in emissions. And obviously, as I said at the very beginning, you know, if you can just phase stuff in, you can, if you can get into here somewhere, maybe maybe if you could just kind of keep it keep it to like here and do something like that. Uh, and slow the warming. That would be that would be I think the most attainable attainable goal. Uh, just I think I have one or more one or two more left. Just to put it you know for Detroit just in, in just into real numbers. We average 13 um, 90 degree days every summer. By 2060 the projection is 37. By 2100 the average is 68. That's the projection. Okay. So I mean if you don't like 90 degree weather uh, you're gonna you're going to see that increase like four times, four to five times by the end of the century if we do nothing. Uh, I think I only have one or two more. Uh, by the way, future uh, um, nights below freezing. Now, this sounds like good news. Okay, We average 118 days uh, in the year right now where we have a temperature below freezing. That will drop to 83 by 2050. By 2100, that drops to 52. Okay. Now, it sounds like good news, but there's one piece of bad news in that, and that is that those periodic Arctic blasts that we get, those kill certain kinds of pests, like ticks, you know, things like that. So if you have mild <laughs> nights in the winter and fewer Arctic blasts, then you're gonna have an increase in those ticks. And even some of the pathogen-bearing um, uh, you know, insects to the south may migrate, are gonna start migrating further northward because they're not gonna be killed off you know, in the winter. So last slide, uh, just, uh, carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So what we're putting us, what we're putting up there right now, and it says it right here, locks us into the impacts that we've talked about. The, uh, the sea level rise, the, the temperature extremes, the precipitation extremes, things like that. So uh, as a final statement, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, uh, back, in, uh, um, back in the year 2000, uh, the city of Detroit, uh, they uh, opened up the time capsule that was sealed in the year 1900, and then they sealed a new time capsule that would be uh, opened in the year 2100. And I was privileged to put a letter in that time capsule for the year 2100, and I decided I'm going to just explain what the current science is about global warming, and I explain the political climate so the people 100 years from now, you know, would uh, would. Uh, Understand kind of the current state of affairs in terms, you know, in terms of both policy as well as the science. And then at the end of the letter, I said, uh, I said, if future research determines that this warming is more of a cyclical type of thing and, and it's it's not unnatural, then this letter is of course of diminished importance. Oops, sorry. But uh, but then I said, and then I said, however, I said it like that. I said, however, if this warming progresses as we think it will, and the ramifications are what we think will be, I said, I pray that 100 years from now, you're not asking the question, 
why didn't you do something 100 years ago when you knew what was happening and you knew what was gonna what was gonna happen? And I and I I I, uh, I repeat that that statement today. Uh, I, it's it's hard to talk to people that we will never see or know, but I hope 100 years from now we're not asking that question. I mean, we kind of we have pretty sudden science here. We you know it's it's pre, it's actually pretty simple physics. You know, temp, I mean heat is. You know, is, is a very simple concept. The greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is a very simple concept. Yes, there are com complexities in there, but the basic science is simple. If you add energy to a system, you get heat. So you add more heat trapping gases to the atmosphere, you have a rise in temperature. It's that simple. So all right, I'll end it with that, and then 